Hey there, Sports History fans. Arnie Chapman here from the Sports History Network to share with you an awesome announcement. Now dig on this. Four of our amazing podcasts have clinched spots in the final round of the Sports Podcast Awards, and we need your support to take home the trophy. First up, we've got Basketball History 101, Driving the Lane in the Best Basketball category. Then on deck, we've got Orville Mulligan, Sports Writer. He's cracking up the competition in the Best Sports Comedy category. Marty's Illegal Stick is dominating the ice next in the Best Hockey category. And last but not least, we have Wrestling with Heels on powerbombing its way to victory in the Best Wrestling category. Now, again, we're counting on you to cast your vote and help out these incredible podcasters secure their well-deserved recognition. It's super easy. All you got to do is head over to the dedicated landing page. That's at sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash vote. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash vote. Now, let's take another look at sports yesteryear with this episode brought to you by, of course, the Sports History Network. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, sports fans, and welcome to another edition of Yesterday Sports on the Sports History Network. Today, we'll have part two of the weightlifting career of an average Joe. By my senior year in high school, I had my driver's license, and I was always looking for part-time jobs to earn some money for gas and car insurance. A friend of my father's sent me to a gym in Nutley, New Jersey. The owner of the gym, Anthony Liberto, had graduated high school with my father's friend's son. So he gave me a job at the gym, which consisted mainly of ensuring all the weights were put back where they belonged and everything was in order. He gave me a little money each week, and he gave me a free membership. So one day, I'm working out there, and I'm doing clean and jerks, once again with horrible technique. Anthony, the gym owner, sees me struggling and comes over to talk to me. He tells me to speak with Brian. Who's Brian, I ask? See that guy over there on the corner doing squats with 500 pounds? That's Brian Derwin. He was a member of the 1980 Olympic team and just returned from an international competition. I figured I had nothing to lose, so I went over and introduced myself. He asked me if I wanted to learn how to do the Olympic lifts. I thought about it momentarily and I had to admit, I was starting to get bored with bodybuilding. I wasn't making the progress I had hoped for. I couldn't seem to gain weight no matter what I did, and I never did enter a competition. My football career hadn't gone the way I expected either. First, I couldn't gain any weight, and I had gone into a bit of a depression during my high school years and it affected my ability to play the game with the same enthusiasm I once had for it. So I said, yes, I do want to learn the Olympic lifts. I need a change in my life, and maybe this is it. Brian told me to meet him at the Belleville High School Stadium on Monday at 6 p.m. The gym is underneath the stadium, he said. I arrived a little before six and looked around for a while, trying to figure out what Brian meant by underneath the stadium. I walked around the stadium several times and finally noticed the door on the far end. I opened the door and heard heavy weights crashing onto the wooden platform. The place was dirty and hot. Picture Mickey's gym from the movie Rocky. I was a little intimidated and thought about leaving when I heard a voice calling out to me. Are you Mark? Yes, I am, I said. Brian isn't here yet, but he told me you'd be stopping by. 
I'm Coach Bucky Cairo. Brian tells want to learn Olympic lifting. Yes, I said. He sized me up and told me I had big hips. He used another word. That's good for Olympic lifting, he said. Let's see you do some squats. I did some squats and he said they were satisfactory. Let's see you do a clean and jerk. I did a clean and jerk and he made a face that told me it was terrible. Have you ever done snatches before, he asked. No, I said. He handed me a broomstick and told me to pretend it was a barbell and I would learn proper technique using that broomstick. Night after night, I used that broomstick. I did squats and overhead presses and worked with the broomstick. It took a lot of patience, but I finally learned proper technique and competed in my first contest in December of 1981. One problem I had during my training was that I was having a tough time finding a pair of weightlifting shoes. Sporting goods stores didn't carry them, and there was no such thing as ordering merchandise online in 1981. Most lifters bought their shoes at competitions or through weightlifting magazines via U.S. mail. These shoes weren't cheap either, and at 19 years old, I didn't have much money. I eventually ordered a pair through one of the magazines, but I borrowed a pair from one of my teammates for this contest. The problem was that they were a size 10, and I wear an eight and a half. I wore three pairs of socks and they were still a little big. The competition was in Vineland, New Jersey, roughly a two hour drive. There were two sessions, one for the lighter weight classes in the morning and one for the heavier weight classes in the afternoon. I was in the 75 kilo weight class, which was in the morning but everyone else on the Belho Barbell Club team was in the heavier weight classes. So we agreed it would be easier for us if I gained a pound or two and moved up to the 82 and a half kilo weight class. This way, we could all lift in the afternoon session. I increased my caloric intake during the week leading up to the contest. But when I weighed in, I was underweight. Thankfully, the weigh-in didn't end for another 30 minutes. My teammates sprang into action, scurrying around the locker room, asking the other lifters if they had any extra food for me. I shoved about three bagels down my throat and drank about a half a gallon of water. I weighed in over the 75 kilo limit, but now, I had to lift with a bloated stomach and shoes that were too big. I snatched 67 and a half kilos, 148 pounds on my opening attempt. And then I missed 72 and a half, 159 pounds twice. Since I only made one of three attempts in the snatch, my confidence was a little shaky going into the clean jerk, my better lift. My coach held me back a little in the clean and jerk because he felt it was important that I make all three lifts successfully. He had me open with 80 kilos, 176 pounds. Then I made 85 kilos, 187 pounds. And finally, 90 kilos, 198 pounds on my third attempt. I was good for at least 95 kilos, 209 pounds, but I couldn't complain. My cousin lifted in the 90 kilo class and made five of six lifts. We drove home together feeling satisfied that our first contest was behind us. Okay, that will conclude this week's podcast. Tune in again next week for part three. Until then, 
take care, and God bless. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I wanted to thank you for stopping by to listen to another episode here on the Sports History Network. Our podcasters are passionate about uncovering and sharing sports stories from yesteryear. And if you didn't know it already, we have over 30 shows across the network covering all sorts of sports history topics. In fact, here's a glimpse into one of our awesome podcasts here on the network. Hello, football friends. This is Darren Hayes of the Pigskin Dispatch Podcast, and I'd like to invite you to the portal of positive football history, Pigskin Dispatch and pigskindispatch.com. We talk about everything that centers around the game of American football, expert discussions, the origins of the games, the great players, teams, and coaches, and more, and some great guests and insights from experts. We have new episodes three to four times a week, and you can find us on sportshistorynetwork.com, pigskindispatch.com, or your favorite podcast provider. How about that? I bet you're super hyped to go listen to that new podcast, right? Well, to learn about this show and all the other podcasts on the network, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Head over there today to find your next favorite sports history podcast.